we are reading together in Genesis chapter 11. <coughs> Genesis chapter 11. And we want to read from verse 10, where the godly line of Shem, <coughs> uh, the son of Noah, is set forth. And um, as we do so, I want us to bear in mind that by the time we come to Terah, there are only two of this list that have died. And the two are Peleg, in verse uh, 16, 17, and then um, Nahor, uh, the father of Terah. So imagine that. Noah actually was still alive at the time of Abram's birth. He was, as far as we can work out, two years um, longer. So that's really important, um, and we said this before, because of um, the scriptures being passed on orally at this stage. And so God had lots of witnesses, kept people alive for a long time. And we now are beginning to see the age declining. But let's remember this this morning. When we read this, everyone apart from Peleg and Nahor are alive at the time that Abram is born. <coughs> These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpatsad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpatsad for 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpatsad had lived for 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpatsad lived after he fathered Shelah for 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived for 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber for 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived for 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg for 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived for 30 years, he fathered Roy. And Peleg lived after he fathered Roy for 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Roy had lived for 32 years, he fathered Serug. And Roy lived after he fathered Serug for 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived for 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Serag lived after he fathered Nahor for 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived for 39 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah for 119 years <coughs> and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived or lived for 70 years, he fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah, in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abraham and Nahor took wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iska. Now Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his grand uh, sorry, his daughter in law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Han. 
Now the Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Amen. Well, as we begin, I want to uh, read uh, some verses from uh, Acts chapter 7. So if you can turn to Acts chapter 7, first of all. Um, because Stephen makes reference to... Um, to Abraham, and it does help us to be sure about our interpretation of Genesis chapter 11 and <coughs> chapter 12, where there's one or two things that are not absolutely clear from the Old Testament text. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Men and brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. When he was in Mesopotamia, that's when he was at Ur, at Ur, before he dwelt in Haran, and said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives, and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would sojourn in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place then he gave them or gave him the covenant of circumcision and so abram begot isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day and isaac begot jacob and jacob begot the twelve patriarchs amen well let's turn back to genesis 11 then last year we looked at the opening chapters of Genesis and we finished with the Tower of Babel. That tragic occasion when humanity had not learned from the past and again sought to reach God by their own initiative. Not by faith in the promised Messiah, the seed of the woman, but they would reach God by their own works. So they set to building a tower that would reach up to heaven. And for the third time, God judged humanity, confusing their language, forcing them to scatter across the face of the earth. And so you have civilizations after this, uh, beginning in Europe, going down into Africa, and then going across um, also into the area that uh, we're going to be looking at uh, this morning, uh, Mesopotamia. And about 250 years later, uh, God intervenes again in the history of the human race. This time, he intervenes quietly. There's no big flood. There's no big gathering of people. In terms of the world, God intervenes unnoticed by and unknown to the world in the call and the life of Abram. It's a new stage in how God is going to, how God is working. He's now focusing on uh, this family within the godly line. And he's going to work through this line for the next 2,000 years until the Christ comes. And then beyond that, he's going to bless 
the nations of the earth through this man who lived uh, from our perspective uh, 4,000 years, over 4,000 years ago. So we today are the children of Abraham, as Paul writes in the New Testament. All who believe were the children of Abraham. He is our father in the faith, though we are Gentiles by birth and background, yet grafted into Christ, we share Abram as our father. Abram's life begins in Ur, the city of Ur, the nation of Chaldea. I hope you got the little map that I put up on the WhatsApp group this morning. Um, he's down in the bank of uh, the <coughs> river Euphrates, close to Basra modern-day Basra, where the British troops were at the time of the Iraq Troubles. And he's less than a hundred miles away from the Persian Gulf. It's a very strategic place, very important place. Ur is the center of culture and commerce and government, uh, and it's a large city. About 100 years ago, there was a huge archaeological dig in the site of Ur, and in the immediate city, they found all kinds of things that showed that this city was very wealthy, very well developed. It had the equivalent of a civil service in those days. It had about 20,000 people at the heart of the city, and then if you took in the suburbs, they estimate 200,000. This is like us in a skillin thinking of Belfast today. So that's where Abram is born. That's where Abram grows up. That's where he lives in the early part of his life. Abram belongs to the tribe of Shem, the godly line, the line from which Messiah will come. <coughs> However, he's living within an ungodly family within the godly line. Because his father uh, and um, his household were told his family, um, Joshua 24 verse 2, served other gods in Ur of the Chaldeans. Ur was a center of men worship. <coughs> Derek Kidner also says, um, uh, Tira, Laban, Sarai, and Milka point towards the moon god as perhaps the most prominent of a panoply of gods or a whole range of gods that they worship. Our passage today um, falls into two parts. Chapter 11, verses 27 to 32, is a bit like a preface in a book. It sets the scene before the real story begins. And it gives you a sense of what's going to happen. It gives us information about the family. And then when you go on to chapter 12, verses 1 to 9, they narrow the focus to Abraham. And we then open the first chapter of the book about Abraham, through whose life and family God was working then, and God is still working today to bless all the nations of the earth in Christ, Abram's descendant. With two points this morning and with two this evening from this section. Right through to verse 9, we'll, that's where we'll end up tonight. First of all, I want us to think about God's providence within Abram's family. God's providence within Abram's family. And we're looking at this section, 27 to 32. It would be very tempting to pass over this and to get into the first chapter. In the same way as you open a book and you don't think about the preface, you just dive in and then you suddenly realize, actually, I'm not getting the plot here. I need to go back to the preface. So we're not going to miss the preface this morning because it's about God's providence within Abram's family. Abram is one of three sons born to Terah. They're not triplets. They were born at three different times. And um, 
the first of which was born when Terah was 70. That's what that verse is saying. The first was born at 70 years of age. We're not told what age Terah was when the others were born, but we'll come back to that later. One of Abraham's brothers, Haran, dies, look at verse 28, before his father, Terah. Now we could pass over those words, but those words are there to make a point. They didn't have to be there, because Haran is of no importance to the bigger story, uh, ultimately. If we hadn't known that um, he was dead, would have just said, well, Lot somehow went along with him, and it wouldn't have made any difference to the story. But this is the first time such an event is recorded. He died before his father, Terah. Now, of course, we know that Cain was killed. But this is a man dying of, it seems, more natural causes. There wasn't uh, envy within the family or whatever. Uh, and it's been highlighted here as very unusual. And we know among our families, if a son dies before his father, it's particularly painful and particularly tragic. And we often hear the phrase, no father or mother expects to bury their son or daughter before them. Rather, the, the purpose, the norm is the other way round. Did Han die from an illness? Did he die from an accident? Was he a victim of a local war? We don't know. We're not told. However, we can say this much. Following Haran's death, what does Terah do? He moves his entire household from Ur. Verse 31. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, his daughter-in-law Sarah, and they went out, don't miss these words, with them from Ur. Went out with a bigger group from Ur. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. Abram's surviving brother, you will have noticed already, Nahor, is not mentioned in this move. And we could conclude that he wasn't part of it. I don't think we should be so quick to conclude that. Because note the phrase, with them. Clearly there are others that travelled from Ur. Now the others, we could say, and somebody could say, well the others are no more than the wider household, the servants, and so on. And yet, when Nair's family appears later in the account of Abraham, providing a wife for Abraham's son Isaac, chapter 24, providing a wife for his grandson Jacob and a place of refuge for Jacob, chapter 27, where is Nahor's family? Are they way down in Ur, in southern Mesopotamia? No, they are in Haran, in northern Mesopotamia. Now it could be that they moved after Abraham, but I think there's a real case to be made out from scripture saying that uh, they moved with Abram and the reason why Nahor is not named as leaving Ur is that Nahor is not a major actor. The focus is on Abraham. The focus is going to be on Lot who comes with Abram ultimately. The focus is going to be on Sarah who's barren and so the fact that Nahor is not mentioned is because he's not a major actor in the story being introduced here. Two further comments I think we want to highlight in this preface as we think about Abram's family and God's providence in it. A providence that has taken in the death of Haran. A providence that causes a father, Terah, to say, I am going to leave down here where there's so much prosperity, there's so much that we can benefit from and I'm going to take my family to actually Canaan. Canaan. Did you notice that? That they set out 
with a view and Terah was going to go to the land of Canaan. That's interesting, isn't it? So you can make of that and think about that um, this afternoon. But there's two further events that happen here. This preface are recorded. Verse 30. But Sarai was bad. So we've had a death. Early death. Why? Because that's the wages of sin. We're now living in a broken world. Where sin impacts lives. We've now got a woman who can't have children. And again, that is contrary to what God commanded in Genesis chapter 1. And what's happening with this woman's living in a broken, sinful world. And yet God is over both events. And indeed, as we will see, he works through both events to accomplish his purpose. So Sarah was man. She had no children. But then look at verse 32. Here we're told the death of Terah. So the days of Terah were 205 years in total. And Terah died in Haran. And then we're told later, what did Abram do? At 75, at his father's death. He left her. So what does that tell us about the age of Terah when Abram was born? Would you take 75 from 205 <coughs> and we get a date of around 135? Huge span. Now some people would say, well that's ridiculous. People weren't having children at that stage. Well, um, they were still in that era, and we read about the others, <coughs> yes, beginning to have children at early ages, but still having children, and we're not told when. And so, um, the only way to understand or to calculate Abram's age is to take the 75 from the 205, which is the two dates that are given, at uh, Tira's death and two events happening at the same time so um, means he was 130 when Abram was born so what are we to learn from this preface what are we to learn here about God's providence within Abram's family well we're to learn family is important family is important family is the basic building unit of in God's purpose in God's plan God works through family and we're going to see that even more as we go on through the scriptures of the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And where God is going to raise up someone to serve in his church, he does it in the context usually of a stable family. Yes, it will not be a perfect family, but it will be a stable family. But we also have to see here that families will end up suffering. There's suffering in families. There's bereavement in families. There's barrenness in families. There's disappointment in families. There's, there's all kinds of painful experiences that come into families. Why? Because sin has now impacted everything, including the family. But we're also seeing here how God is faithful to his promise and purpose to bring salvation through his Messiah. Neither promise nor purpose is hindered by the human unbelief that is within the family of Abraham or by the ungodly context into which Abraham is born or grows up in Ur of the Chaldeans. God is going to call Abram. He's going to save Abram from his sin. He's going to cause Abram <coughs> to see the Christ afar off. As the one who would be the, the, um, the, the serpent crusher. And the one who would destroy a, a serpent and deliver from sin. And then we see also 
God is active in the events of life. The early death of Haran and even the barrenness of Sarai. The early death of Haran becomes the occasion when Terah moves his family from Ur to Haran. And he follows that Euphrates River upstream for 600 miles. So God is at work in families. And he works within the family. And we should see here actually that God, I, I, I don't mean this irreverently, but God is not in a hurry. He doesn't work to our schedule, in our families, or to our timetable. He has his purpose, he has his promise to us, and we hold on to those, and we work within those believing that his timing is always perfect. That's the first thing. The second thing we want to see this morning is God's word within Abram's life. God's word within Abram's life. We move now from God's providence, chiefly in the life of Terah as the head of the family, to God's word in the life of Abram. Derek Kidner says, God speaking this, in a nutshell, differentiates Abram's story from his father's. So God's not just controlling things now by what he allows to happen, what he causes to happen, but now he actively intervenes with his word. Look at what he does. He, God reveals himself through words. He makes his salvation known through words. Not through pictures, not through dreams, but through words. He reveals as well what he requires of us through words. And that is why we place such emphasis on the Bible, on the scriptures. On reading the scriptures and preaching the word of God on the Lord's day. On studying the word of God on a Wednesday evening. It's at the center of what we do. And it's why we say that in this age when we're privileged to have the scriptures in our own homes, the word of God should be central in personal life and family life. And we'll come to that this evening again because we read of Abram building altars in Canaan. So, Abram lived in the era when God's word had not been given in its fullness or final form. So verse 1 states, Now the Lord had said to Abram. Notice the words, the Lord. Capital letters. This is the name that God later uses to reveal himself to Moses. When Moses says, What name are you known by? I'm known by the Lord. It's that name which means, I'm the God who makes a covenant of salvation. And I reveal it through my word to men and women, boys and girls, so that they receive my salvation in my Christ, who's ultimately symbolized by all the sacrifices, uh, and uh, sorry, who is symbolized by all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. And so uh, it's the Lord. The Lord who's speaking, and, he's, and we should. This is the time when Abram was brought into saving faith with God, looking to the Christ, looking beyond the animal sacrifices that are part of the godly line. And now the Lord, we're told, can either be said or had said. It's better translated here as had said. Because it shows us and reminds us that the Lord had spoken to Abraham, not when he was at Haran, but when he was at Ur. When he was starting there in that city that was prosperous and thriving and life was good and doing well for Abraham and his family. And it's a fresh word, it's a personal word, it's a challenging word. It's a word that has not been previously heard. And those words had said, lead us to say God spoke to Abram while Terah was alive 
and while they were at Ur, Acts 7, the God of glory appeared to our <coughs> father Abram when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Because both Haran and Ur are in Mesopotamia. Ur is in the south, Haran's in the north. But scripture, Stephen makes it absolutely clear. God's word within Abram's life comes to him when he is at Ur. God spoke to Abram in his homeland, in pagan Chaldea, in the home city that's so affluent and so culturally and commercially developed, and yet it's worshipping false gods such as the moon, and Abram's living in an unbelieving family. We don't know at what age the Lord spoke to him, at what time of life, but look at what he says. Get out of your country, from your family and your father's house, to a land that I will show you. What is God's word? How can we sum this up? This verse 1 of chapter, of chapter 12. Well, God's word, we could put it like this. It asks him to forsake, and it asks him to follow. That's salvation. That's the call of salvation, to forsake and to follow. To forsake the old way of life, to forsake the friendship of years, to forsake the wider family, to forsake the city, the country, the comfort, uh, the riches, to forsake what is familiar, and to forsake his future prospects. We all know that. If you're in a job or if you're in business or whatever, you have prospects. <coughs> you leave that job <coughs> not to know where you're going or what you're going to do. You have no prospects and um, or no immediate, uh, no future prospects, no sure prospects. And Abraham forsakes that. He forsakes for what uh, all of this for what is unknown. Get out is a one word command. It literally is go! Go! It's that stark. And it's that simple. And it's that searching. It leaves no room for maneuver. It's a word to forsake. But then it's a word to follow. Um, to a land I will show you. Now, typically, people do not leave a place without knowing where they're going. I've never moved in my 63 years without knowing where I was going. I can remember the morning I left home in September 1980 and a sense of finality thinking, I will not, this will not be my home from now on. But I knew I was going to Belfast. I knew what I was going to do. And that's typical, isn't it? And we don't advise young people to um, to go or anybody to um, to go and to give up everything without <coughs> knowing clearly what they're going to and where they're going to. Because God is the God who's guided us in the past. That's what's different for us. We're already believers. He's brought us to where we are, and He's given us what we're doing. And we can't and we shouldn't walk away from that lightly or easily without being sure that God has called us to walk away. And we'll see that in a future week. In fact, we'll see it next week. Abraham walked away from where God had put him when he shouldn't have walked away without any word from God. So this is Abraham's, uh, uh, the, the, the phrase literally is, uh, to the land I will show you. It's literally to the land I will cause you to see. But there is an aspect of our faith which is about following. Do I know what's going to happen tomorrow? Do you know what's going to happen in 10 years' time? No. So there is an aspect in which we have got to follow by faith and we trust the Lord that he's going to take us to the land that he will cause us to see. And he could move any of us to that eternal land at any moment. Or... In years to come, he may cause us to live somewhere else. But it's got to be him causing it to see it, us to see it. It must be of him 
when we move. Not of ourselves, not of the will, not of the flesh of man. So this is Abram's call. It's a decisive call. It's, this is an important moment in moments in Abram's life. He must choose. Either I am going to follow the living God, or I am going to follow the false God. And there's times in our lives when we will have to choose. <coughs> am I going to follow the living God, the living Christ, or am I going to follow a, a career or the material things that will make me secure and, and get me on in the world? It's a key moment. It's a critical moment in Abram's life. His future rests on this choice. His eternal destiny depends on this choice. Abram's call or God's word within Abram's life. It's a word to forsake sin and it's a word to follow. And nothing has changed though we live in a different era. We live in a different part of the earth. God's call, God's word of salvation through Jesus Christ comes to us as a word to forsake. The word to follow. It's to forsake our sin. It's to follow Christ. To build our lives on him. is the one who is the way, the truth and the life. Knowing that no one comes to the Father except by him. And if anyone's listening, either now or later, and you have not forsaken the gods of this world that seem to keep coming up again and again, the riches, the sports, the activities that people build their lives on in this world who are not believers. If you haven't forsaken those for Christ, you need to forsake them. And you need to say, there's one person I follow. There's one person who will show me and cause me to see the land of heaven. And that is Jesus Christ. And then it's a call. It's a call to forsake sin. It's a call to follow Christ. But you see that call. It's not momentary. Sometimes we hear people giving their testimony. And it's as if the moment of salvation. That's the only moment there's a call to forsake. And a call to follow. And they'll tell you about how wicked their life was. Up to the point of their conversion. And then full stop. That's not what's happening. That's not biblical. That's not salvation. Whatever it is, God's call is not momentary. It is God's call on our lives for our entire life. And daily and continually throughout life, his word comes to us. And it's a word which says to us today as we read it in our own lives, in our own families, forsake Sin, forsake the gods of this world. Follow Christ, pursue holiness. Be part of his church, make a difference for him in the world. Forsake the applause of the world for the reproach of Christ. Forsake the riches of the world for the persecutions that we read earlier in our call to worship that come from following Christ. And there are even activities and opportunities that are not wrong in themselves. It's not wrong for someone to, to take promotion. It's not wrong for someone to have a bigger house or a new car in and of itself. Not wrong in itself. But we may have to forsake things which others follow in order to have time and opportunity and energy for service for Christ in his church, in the community, in the world, to witness to a perishing world. And I want to close with an illustration of that. C.T. Studd was a really good cricket player. He had a glorious career opening up before him after he left Cambridge in the world of cricket. And C.T. Stubb forsook that career in cricket to follow Christ and to go to the mission field. C.T. Stubb.
to God's word. <coughs> it comes to us in salvation. It comes to us calling us to a life of forsaking and a life of following. And so let's take time this day. Let's be aware this week as we read scripture. Are there ways in which God is calling me to forsake something that is hindering me in the journey of faith? That's hindering my usefulness in his church. That's compromising my witness in the world. God's providence within Abram's family. God's providence within Abram's life. The beginning of the journey. And that's true for us as well. The journey has begun when we can see God's providence. And when we hear God's word and receive it and follow it diligently and continually, albeit not perfect.